Number 10, the first beast. Let's open up the first point of this list with, of course, the first beast. The first beast is one of two creatures that are described in the book of Revelation, saying to appear one after the other. So let's go over how this beast is explained in the book. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. So yeah, pretty damn crazy. Each head is supposed to represent a king, hence the crowns, thought to maybe be a representation of Roman emperors. And the first beast was said to be a king itself, but it was cast into perdition before it ever had a chance to rule. Number 9, the second beast. Now second on this list, we're obviously going to move on to the second beast, which arrives after the first, of course. This one doesn't get a description as long and detailed as the first, but is described as follows. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It's also said to have incredible powers, and it performed great signs even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. It's most known, however, for its creation of the Mark of the Beast. This is a sign that is used to identify people who follow the Beast of the Sea, usually seen as the Antichrist. So the second beast would mark humans with this symbol and direct them to follow after the first beast, and for this it is also described as being the False Prophet, the two said to have been sent by Satan to take control and deceive people. Number eight. Pit locusts. This next creature is not one single creature, but is instead a terrifying prediction for those of us who aren't fans of creepy crawlies. The Bible describes ten different plagues, one of these being five months of torment caused by pit locusts. And here's how the Bible describes them. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Definitely not something you would want to run into while out on a hike. The scariest part of this is that it's actually pretty likely to happen. In 2016, enough locusts to cover 270,000 square miles invaded Russia. Number 7, Cherubim. The cherub that you're probably imagining is likely a fat little baby spitting water into a fountain. But cherubs in the Bible were actually pretty different, being described as otherworldly beings with four faces that emerge from smoke and fire. Here's a snippet of how they are explained in Ezekiel. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides, they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each of them went straight forward without turning as they went. They appear in the Bible over 90 times and are said to be God's throne bearers and his attendants, representing God's spirit on earth and symbolizing his worship. Number 6, Behemoth. According to the book of Job, sometimes referred to as simply Job, the Behemoth was God's first ever creation. Supposedly a giant creature with tremendous power, it's described as follows. Behold Behemoth, which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold his strength in his loins, and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. It is said to be a primeval monster of chaos being defeated by Yahweh at the beginning of the process of creation. And according to a later Jewish tradition, it was said that the behemoth would become food for the righteous at the end time. Some historians believe that the behemoth may have been an early exaggerated description of an elephant or hippopotamus. Number 5, Leviathan. No, it's not just a roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. The Leviathan is a creature that goes hand in hand with the behemoth. The Leviathan 
Leviathan was a sea monster with multiple heads that was mainly featured in the Old Testament, and just like the behemoth, is said to be a beast of chaos and is also said to be killed by God. One excerpt saying, In that day the Lord will take his sharp, great, and mighty sword, and bring judgment on Leviathan the fleeing serpent, Leviathan the coiling serpent, and he will slay the dragon of the sea. The Leviathan is probably the beginning of many sea monster stories that would come about as humans started to take to the water and explore the oceans. Famous ones include Sir Humphrey Gilbert's description of a sea creature with the head of a lion, the legendary kraken, and the one we all know, the Loch Ness Monster. Number 4. Giants Giants aren't just found hiding up beanstalks, and they are described many times within the pages of the Bible. One of the most famous probably being Goliath, who is slain by David. Samuel saying, And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coast was 5,000 shekels of bronze. There is in fact a whole race of giants mentioned who are called the Amorites, being brought up more than 80 times. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. If they were truly as tall as cedars, that would put them at around 50 to 100 feet tall. Number 3. Werewolves I'll be clear here, the Bible does not ever refer to werewolves by name, but it does have plenty of imagery and stories that lend themselves to our current understanding of the creature. In the book of Daniel, we see God curse a man into becoming an animal, one of the most significant references to lycanthropy and transformation within the Bible. It says, You shall be driven from men, and your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field, and you will eat grass as oxen, and will be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven years will pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whoever he will. Werewolves have also been mentioned in times coming even before Christianity. This excerpt comes from a book written in the year 440 BCE. It may be that these people are wizards, for the Scythians and the Greeks settled in Scythia say that once a year every one of the Nuri becomes a wolf for a few days and changes back again to his former shape. Those who tell this tale do not convince me, but they tell it nonetheless and swear to its truth. Number 2. Daniel's Four Beasts This next one is not one beast, but actually four. In the book of Daniel, the prophet has a vision of four different beasts representing four empires. They all emerge from the sea, wreaking terror and destruction. But like many of the creatures before them, they die during their time on earth. They are described as follows. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. And devour flesh they certainly did. The fourth beast is said to be the one that would devour the entire earth. Number 1. Unicorns You probably don't think of unicorns as anything scary, just some fantastical horse with a horn on its head. But unicorns in the Bible are actually pretty terrifying. Similarly to werewolves, the unicorn isn't actually called by that name in the Bible, but the description has led most people to believe that that's what it is, and future translations do include the word unicorn. The quote goes as follows. It's said to have the body of a bull and a single horn that is similar to an ox. Deuteronomy saying, a firstborn bull, he has majesty, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox. With them he shall gore the peoples, all of them, to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. So yeah, these guys were actually pretty mean. Their horn is not used for spreading the magic of friendship, but instead used for killing people. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have dragons. As it turns out, dragons aren't just fantastical creatures from the Middle Ages with stories of knights and heroism, and they aren't just adorable, rideable friends from modern movies. They're in the Bible too. But they definitely weren't friends. This dragon was actually the devil himself. Here's how it's described in Revelation. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the world astray. 
The devil takes many forms throughout his descriptions in the Bible, and here he is described as having seven heads and ten horns, and has a tail capable of sweeping one third of the stars out of the sky. While you may just see this as some symbolic imagery, it's not hard to believe that with all the other terrifying creatures in the Bible, they could have been describing the dragon quite literally. In our number nine spot today, we have Nephilim. The Nephilim are creatures that are neither angel nor human. They are in fact the result of angels having children with human women. While they are sometimes grouped alongside with giants due to them sometimes being described as quite large, they are actually much more than giants. Genesis refers to them as heroes of old, men of renown. People find Nephilim fascinating due to the fact that they can be found in many different cultures and mythologies across the world. Ever heard of Percy Jackson? Pretty similar concept, right? The children of gods and humans. Most of the Nephilim ended up being wiped out in the flood and any remaining were wiped out in the following wars. There is also apparently a reason that there have been no recent sightings of Nephilim or similar creatures beyond the fact that you may believe they never existed. God decided that any of his creatures who mated with a human would be quote bound in everlasting chains. In our number 8 spot today we have vampires. Turns out that these blood sucking beasts aren't just from twilight and they definitely aren't as hot as Robert Pattinson or sparkle in the sunlight either. Vampires actually appear in the bible at least 50 times. Here's one way that they're mentioned, quote, There are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives, to devour the poor from off of the earth, the needy from among mankind. While some people say that it's obviously just some colourful imagery and not actually vampires, there are many theologists who believe the link between the devil, drinking blood, and sinning is pretty clear. While the word vampire is never explicitly used in the Bible, the term vampire itself didn't actually appear until around the 15th century. Also, stories of blood sucking creatures goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, so it's definitely possible that vampires were around, they just didn't know what to call them yet. In our number 7 spot today we have the 200 million horsemen. What's worse than 4 horsemen? 200 million horsemen, of course. But instead of representing the apocalypse, I'd argue that these ponies are just a little bit creepier. Appearing in the book of Revelation, here's how they are described. The horses have the head of lions, and they are spitting smoke, fire, and brimstone from their mouths. They also have the tail of serpents. It's not just the horses that are bad, the riders are said to claim a third of all humans' lives on earth, and the army is led by four fallen angels. Definitely not an army that any military Terry would even attempt to take out. Even if someone did want to fight them, it is said that they are invisible to quote unbelievers, so some of us may have a pretty hard time winning that fight. Also, for the population at the time, if they wanted to kill a third of human lives, each horseman only needed to kill about seven people, which doesn't seem that difficult. In our number 6 spot today we have Woman on a Beast. The Woman and the Beast, also known as the Scarlet Women, and a much much more rude name that I probably can't say here, is mentioned in the book of Revelation. She is of course a woman who is riding on a scarlet coloured beast with 7 heads and 10 horns on her forehead. It says quote, Babylon the Great, Mother of Earth's Abominations. The beast seems to represent the devil, as it's said its number is 666, and it is given the power of the dragon which previously represented him. As such, the woman is seen as a false prophet and a large representation of Im immorality. Many people choose to follow and worship the beast as they believe it is stronger and more powerful than any other creature, and all those who do receive the mark of the beast. Eventually the two are both caught and they are thrown into a river of fire and sulfur. In our number 5 spot today we have Daniel's angel. Physical descriptions of angels aren't often seen within the bible, but when they do show up they are actually pretty scary. And you definitely probably wouldn't want to meet one in real life. In the book of Daniel, Daniel's going through a pretty rough time, going through a period of time where he didn't bathe, drink wine, or eat any good food. Hey, I've been there Daniel, don't worry about it. But then an angel appears to him, never happened to me, quote, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. So let's break that down. Basically this angel had a crystal body an electric face, shot fire out of his eyes, and spoke with the voice of an entire crowd. Sounds pretty terrifying to me, but hey, be not afraid. 
right? In our number four spot today, we have Ophanim. While we're on the topic, let's take a look at some more terrifying angels. I really don't know why we couldn't have just stuck with beautiful winged people. To each their own, I guess. These guys are said to be the second highest and most holy of the ten orders of angels, and their bonkers physical description is one you've probably seen depicted before. Here's what Ezekiel has to say. And then I saw four wheels beside the cherubim, one beside each cherub. The wheels radiating were sparkling like diamonds in the sun. All four wheels looked alike, each like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they went in any of the four directions, but in a perfectly straight line. Where the cherubim went, the wheels went straight ahead. The cherubim were full of eyes in their backs, hands, and wings. The wheels likewise were full of eyes. I heard the wheels called wheels within wheels. So yeah, they're basically giant spheres of wheels covered in eyes. Pretty creepy if you ask me. In our number three spot today, we have the Seraphim. While you may understand Seraphim as being some of the most holy angels and protectors of God, this isn't actually the only way the term is used. When the Israelites rebel to the wilderness, God sends out venomous snakes to kill them. These cobra-like animals being referred to as Seraphim. It describes a snake whose bite causes a painful burning sensation and then a severe inflammation that leads to death. The wilderness finally being described as a thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. So not just snakes, but also scorpions. Think personally, I might put off camping for a little while. There are also a couple of times where seraphim are referred to as being demonic in nature, likely due to their association with what happened in the wilderness. In our number two spot today, we have cockatrice. Cockatrices within the Bible are often described as being half rooster and half snake, and it is sometimes used interchangeably with a creature known as the basilisk, saying that a cockatrice can only be killed if made to look at its own reflection. They apparently live in a hole in the ground and are incredibly poisonous. One bite from them could be enough to kill you. It is also said that they quote, possess the most deadly powers, plants withering at its touch, and men and animals dying poisoned by its look. Which does start to sound pretty familiar if you compare it to Harry Potter's depiction of a basilisk. It is described as a fiery flying serpent, and if you already didn't like snakes, just wait until you see a flying snake covered in fire. No, thank you. In our number one spot today, we have Donkey. Oh my gosh, this one is not exactly terrifying, but it is an honorable mention. This is not just a regular donkey, but a talking donkey. I feel like I'm in Shrek. In the stories, a prophet named Balaam was told to curse God's people, being given gifts to try and accomplish this. But God tells him not to, but he's pretty excited over all of these riches he's being promised if he does do it. So he disobeys God, riding out on a donkey. The donkey is stopped in the road when he sees an angel, and Balaam tries to hit him, trying to get him to move. God then gives the donkey the power to speak, but instead of making waffles, the donkey is pretty mad about being hit. He says, am I not thine ass? Which you gotta admit is pretty funny. Or maybe I just have a childish sense of humor. In our number nine spot today, we have Gabriel. So in many of the texts, angels are like the messengers of God, but they also have their own powers and abilities that they can use as they see fit. In one particular story, Archangel Gabriel is sent to announce the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah. But when Gabriel does this, he gets a less than enthusiastic response from Zechariah. In fact, this response was one of protest, and Gabriel simply did not like that. He said, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. I guess the lesson here is to listen to an angel if it appears to you and tells you that you're gonna have a kid? I'm not sure. At the end of the day, it's a bit of a dark way to deliver the good news. In our number seven spot today, we have Raphael. Raphael is one of the true archangels and is the fourth of the oldest of the five. He is a powerful healer, a guardian angel, and a great fighter, so you might be wondering why he landed a spot on today's list. Well, there's just one story in particular that I really wanted to talk about 
about and that story comes from the book of Enoch. Raphael is in a battle with the demon Azazel. Raphael is able to defeat the demon but decides to subject him to a fate worse than death. The story writes, quote, bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert which is in Duodel and cast him therein and place upon him rough and jagged rocks and cover him with darkness and let him abide there forever and cover his face that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire. If that wasn't clear enough, Raphael tied this demon up, buried him alive in a hole full of rocks in the middle of the desert, where he just now gets to wait until he can be thrown into a fire and burned alive. In our number six spot today, we have the angel of death. Within the Hebrew Bible, there are many stories where the Lord sent his angel of death to wipe out any enemies of the Israelites. I mean, one of these stories is the one that is behind what we now know as Passover. And while that is the most famous example, there is apparently a larger one that took place. In 701 BC, it is said that this angel was able to save Jerusalem from an invasion by Sennacherib's army, but it was not without the loss of life, of course. If unfamiliar, Sennacherib, whose name means sin has replaced the brothers, was the king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire from 705 BC until 681 BC. In the end, it is said that in order to save Jerusalem from the invasion, the angel of death was responsible for wiping out 185,000 men completely in just one night. In our number 5 spot today we have Abiz the Boo. This fallen angel is described in the testament of Solomon which I know is not really regarded in the canon of the scripture but I had to include him. He is said to be one of the angels that followed Beelzebub upon his fall from heaven. He is the sin of pride and is known for his ability to lead people astray. He is most easily summoned in the month of July during the fifth hour of the night so careful. After his fall from grace he was left with only one red wing and was condemned to hell. He is said to have control over the imprisoned souls of Tartarus and plays a primary role in the demon world. He himself claims that he was once an angel in what is referred to as the first heaven and after his fall he began to roam Egypt. During his time in Egypt he met with Moses and the Israelites during the exodus and opposed them. This is when he decided to harden the pharaoh and his advisors heart and convince them to pursue those who were fleeing. He went with the Egyptian army in pursuit of the Israelites but the collapsing Red Sea crushed and drowned him which left him imprisoned in a pillar of water. Despite being trapped, Beelzebub says that he will return for conquest. In our number three spot today, we have Uriel. There are stories and texts that say that fallen angels were mating with humans and creating this sort of race of giants. Personally, I think that sounds kind of cool, but according to the text, people did not like that at all, and that includes the archangel Uriel. He was not the only one who was against this, but he was only one of the four who spoke up about it and asked for some sort of divine intervention. Prevention. Also, it's not like he felt anyone was innocent in this mix. Humans were looked on as being just as guilty as the angels, and ignorance was not an excuse. This is all what led to the great flood of the earth in order to rid the world of giants and quote unquote cleanse the earth. The text says, Here shall stand the angels who have connected themselves with women, and their spirits assuming many different forms are defiling mankind, and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as gods. Here shall they stand till the day of the great judgment, in which they shall be judged till they are made an end of. And the women also of the angels who went astray shall become sirens. In our number two spot today, we have Belial. Belial is one of the crowned princes of hell, but he is also known as hell's brightest fire, evil's match, the king of evil, and he is the personification of wickedness in the Jewish faith. He is mighty and powerful, and this is likely due to the fact that he was created right after Lucifer, which is of course part of the reason why Belial belongs to his order. Belial was once an angel, but after his fall from grace, he became a demon of lies and guilt, and he possesses the ability to induce any type of sin, but his favorite of the sins is lust. Belial is so evil that it's said he started a civil war in hell. While still an angel just before his fall in the war of heaven, Belial slayed numerous angels, and as a demon, just in general, he would slay huge demonic armies that attempted to make any moves against him or any of the other seven and great kings. In our number one spot today, we have Lucifer. Lucifer was an angel before he fell from grace. In the book of Isaiah, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Lucifer is now the ruler of hell, and he commands an entire army of sinners and demons, and he even tried to organize an uprising against God. 
so I think it's pretty clear exactly why he is a terrifying entity. He also uses his power to send terrible people to Earth in order to terrorize everyone, as well as to try and tempt non-sinners into the dark side. It is said that Lucifer also might just be the one who is responsible for the original sins that were seen in the Garden of Eden. Some believe that he is the snake who placed the temptation there. Thank you.